or this workshop roundtable uh, to discuss uh, why shift left isn't enough. Uh, I'm really hoping that this will be a very interactive session, and I know we've only got a couple of folks in here right now, but I'm hoping that uh, this will be very, very interactive and that we'll be able to uh, have a, uh, a discussion around this because I think, you know, a lot of times one of the challenges that we see uh, regularly between uh, the development team and the security team or the business unit and the security team or whoever in the security team is that the security team has this idea that everything's too risky and there's too much uh there's too many threats out there that we can't do anything unless the security is near perfect um i won't say it's ever perfect but um coming from the security side i know that we have a a bad reputation a bad habit of slowing things down and of making it difficult to get uh, our business done because there's always some security feature or function that uh, box that has to be checked, uh, whether it's you know coming from some compliance requirement or whether it's an internal compliance requirement or whether it's just you know that the CISO needs it in order to feel comfortable uh, with the release of that particular product or platform, anything like that. So what I want to do today is really talk about uh, why shift left is not enough. And let me let me share my screen here real quick. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, and I'm going to put my uh, uh, I'm going to be watching the Q&A since it's it's just me in here from no name. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A side. Uh, I know there's a chat. Uh, box as well. Um, if you drop it in there, I don't think it gives me a notification that there's a new chat. And so I'll, I'll be watching the Q&A uh, while I go through this discussion. Uh, but, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence that says a lot of organizations are putting a significant amount of effort into the, uh, uh, into the, sh the, the shift left uh, development in their organization. Um, they're utilizing API gateways. They're utilizing web application firewalls. Uh, they're using, uh, you know, testing capabilities and, and all kinds of other um, uh, uh, shift left capabilities in order to be able to, uh, to do all of the security stuff as far left of deployment as possible, and 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 that's where I I draw the line. Is once it's deployed, you're no longer in shift left. Now you're in what I like to call shield right or protect right, right. Once it hits that deployment stage, now we're looking at how do we monitor it, how do we make sure that it is deployed the way that it was designed, and that the security mechanisms that were intended on the left hand side are in place once this thing goes into production. And one of the things that, that we often find in, in watching and, and seeing customers' networks uh, is that we don't always match up on what was designed and what was documented uh, on the left and what was uh, actually deployed on the right. And whether that's because changes just didn't get communicated or how that happens, no blame to be pushed out here. I'm not trying to, to direct and say that somebody on the development team ever did anything wrong. All I'm saying is that the security team needs to know about what data is being moved around, how it's being moved, what, you know, uh, who has access to that data, you know, is it confidential, is it, is it accurate, all those kinds of things. That's the role of the security team is to protect that data uh, from unauthorized use, disclosure, all those kinds of things. So let's, let's talk about this just a little bit. And uh, again, I'm going to be monitoring the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so if you're coming in just now and, and have questions, uh, please drop them in the Q&A side so I can see them. Um, and there we go. All right. So why is this important now? Well, I think over the last five to seven years I, that we have had an amazing explosion in the number of APIs. And, and, you know, in the last year, of course, COVID had something to do with that. But even before then, the, the move to the cloud the digital transformation, I'm not big on buzzwords, but digital transformation meant everybody was moving to the cloud and they now had to have these connectors between all of their different data sources and all of their different platforms that they were going to uh, be utilizing this data on. 
we came to the realization, I think uh, somewhere in the early part of that, that in many cases, our data is our most critical asset. It is the thing that our business runs on. And we may have supplies and we may have products that we sell and we may you know, create widgets. And those widgets are really important. But if we lose our data, we very likely lose our whole business. And so these APIs became mission critical. Uh, and I utilize the, uh, uh, and having been on the security side, I have seen uh, the security team lose the argument again and again and again, because the business unit needs to have this done in order for the revenue to be generated, in order for the capability to be stood up. We can't wait, we've got to do it. We're willing to accept the additional risk. And so the security team gets stuck with the, okay, now what? There's a risk here, how do we defend against it? And I want to talk about you know why the security and development velocity are always in conflict. Um, there's this challenge that we have of, of adding more data and, and providing more data and interconnecting platforms uh, is so critical. Um, and as a result, we really need to uh, make sure that both the security team and the development team are in sync with things. And, and here at No Name, our goal is to make sure that we aren't the part of the organization that says no, no, no. In fact, we want to be able to say yes more and more and more often. We want to be able to say, hey, yes, we know there's a vulnerability there, but guess what? We have an integration that will protect if somebody were to try and exploit that vulnerability. Or we have the ability to monitor for the exploitation of that vulnerability and then take an automatic reaction or action against that particular uh, vulnerability in order to protect those systems. So instead of slowing the security process down, we're adding a layer of security that works whether or not we have all of the information from the development team in order to be able to adequately protect. And the example that I often use is that uh, you develop a web application, you get ready to deploy it. Now it's the security team's responsibility to make sure that that web application is probably proper properly configured in the web application firewall. That takes time. That means that there's uh, you know, different things that have to be configured with domains and port numbers and acceptable values and, and all of these kinds of things. We have to tune that web application firewall to work properly. What we like to see happen is that that the process can go much, much faster, at least from an API perspective, because we can discover the APIs before they are uh, as they are deployed into the new environment, and we can immediately identify if there's issues or vulnerabilities associated with them, either because we have visibility into the prior testing capability, or because we see the way and the actual way that that API was deployed, as opposed to the way it was designed and, and the way it was supposed to be deployed. So the truth is, mistakes happen. And, and again, not trying to blame anybody, but we want to be that layer on top that says, hey, when the mistake happens, we're there to get your back. We've got you in case something happens. We want to be that one that says, hey, you forgot to check this box in the OWASP policy uh, so that this particular platform or so that this particular API has that protect protection. So again, why now? APIs are the, a top, the top attack vector um, today. I know Gartner said it would be 2022. I've actually spoken with Gartner several times over the last couple of months, and they told me they missed it, that yes, 2021 was the year that APIs became the top attack vector. And I think we're seeing that in a lot of the bug bounty reports that are coming out these days. We're seeing it in different exploits that have happened. Uh, in fact, if we take a look at what's gone on, you know, some of these came from bug bounties, some of them came from uh, actual exploits, uh, others came from just security researchers who are letting organizations know. The John Deere attack, if you haven't seen that one, was, uh, was a, a, a very interesting one. Could tell you where your tractor was and, and what the VIN number of the tractor was and all those kinds of things. Uh, what version of software it was running. Experian exposed a lot of, uh, a lot of records, uh, through an attack. Peloton was, you know, uncovered a, a huge vulnerability in their APIs. Uh, we could go on and on and on. In fact, the one that I'm missing on this that you might recognize, of course, is LinkedIn. Uh, just recently, LinkedIn announced that they had a vulnerability that exposed 700 million user records. 
So that's a lot. And uh, that's a big problem. Uh, and these kinds of things are continuing to grow because they're getting visibility in the security world. And, you know, it was pretty easy to come up with this list of organizations that have been compromised by APIs uh, or who have had API vulnerabilities exposed either by bug bounty or by actual hackers. It, because it was so easy, guess what? That means more people are going to be targeting APIs uh, going forward in the future. And there's a number of publicly available programs and platforms and everything else uh, processes that you can get a hold of that will help you to identify or utilize the bug bounty programs and those kinds of things to discover these uh, these uh, problems. So at, at No Name, we have developed the DART API security strategy, and it stands for Discover, Analyze, Remediate, and Test. The importance of this is, uh, is that you can utilize the DART API security strategy regardless of what state your API security program is in today. So if you're just beginning your API security uh, you know, program and you haven't really done much yet with it, this is very applicable to you. If you have an extremely mature, which to be honest with you, I've talked to, I don't know how many hundred CISOs uh, about their API security strategy. Nobody really has a great API security strategy today. They might have a good one, but it doesn't seem comprehensive. They're all saying we need more. Yeah, very few people of large, with large mature security organizations are saying we need more intrusion prevention systems or we need more anti-malware, or we need more endpoint detection and response. They've already got those, they've got those things in place, but where they know that they've got a gap today is in API security. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody that said, we have all of this in completely wrapped up. We know exactly what we're doing and have it all done. Uh, they re those, those organizations just, I don't think exist today because this is too new. The threat vector is is more prevalent than anybody, almost anybody expected it uh, to be, uh, and it is uh, a bigger. It's a it's a more difficult thing to to chomp off than uh, the uh, than what we've seen in the past because of the way that it gets deployed. And and let me talk about that for just a second. Um, and by the way, again, let me stop. If you have any questions, please uh, drop them in the Q and A. I would love to. Uh, make this a little bit more interactive. I haven't seen any questions yet. Let me just double check the chat, see if there was any that are dropped in there. No. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Um, I, uh, I appreciate your time and, and, and attention. Um, so I've got over 30 years of experience in, in cybersecurity. I was a terminal area security officer in 1986, uh, writing C code for Air Force systems to be uh, C2 compliant by 92. And guess what? We never made it. Um, I helped stand up the app cert in the early days, and I was responsible for doing penetration testing on 130 Air Force bases uh, all over the world. Uh, after I left the Air Force and the uh, defense uh, contracting positions, uh, I became a pen tester and cybersecurity consultant for a number of different organizations. Uh, so did a lot of pen testing and testing applications and specifically testing APIs is very, very different than testing, uh, than the old days of pen testing. We used to get our get out of jail free card and it, and it would tell us, hey, you can attack everything in this domain. You can attack everything in this range of IP addresses. And if they were really cautious, they might even put some port limitations in there. We don't want you to test these ports because maybe they had SCADA systems or something on those ports that uh, uh, would be problematic. Um, and so what we would do is we would go in and we would scan all of the IP addresses in the range that they gave us. And then we would scan all 65,535 TCP and UDP ports. And we would be able to tell them what services were being offered. And then we would be able to tailor our uh, exploits against the services that we were seeing. If there was a DNS exploit, we could run it on port 53. We knew how to do that. If there was an HTTP, we knew to do that on port 80 or HTTPS on port 443 or whatever it was. We would look at all of those different services. We would get all that information and then we would go after it. The challenge with APIs is much, much different because you could have 
a large number of endpoints on a single port on a single of, uh, IP address. And think about the idea of being able to see that there's slash user, slash details, slash number, slash API uh, in, in that one port on that one API, and then all of the different iterations that you could have of that path to get to APIs. Finding those then becomes very, very difficult. And you have to look for the, uh, you have to look for the, um, uh, the, the patterns that are created within the applications and hope that you can guess those patterns and find uh, APIs. And the chances are you're never gonna find all of them. And that's why the discovery process is so important from a security perspective. Now, if everything were perfect, if every API ran through an API gateway, and if every API was cataloged and documented exactly the way it was uh, deployed, there would be no need to have this, this discovery. It would be really easy. You just give the security guys read-only access to your catalog and you'd be done. But that never happens. It never, ever happens. Every organization we talk to has 30 to 40% of their APIs that don't go through an API gateway. Uh, they have some of those that are exposed to the internet and still don't go through an API gateway or a web application firewall and may or may not uh, go through, go down the, uh, uh, go down through the, the recommended path to get that API out into the public world. So the, the explosion of the cloud, the loss of the perimeter because of that, and there's a lot of documentation out there around that, uh, and the ability that, um, uh, that it takes to, uh, to find these APIs makes it super important that you discover uh, all of the APIs in your environment. Uh, Gartner says you can't discover uh, or, you, or you can't protect what you don't know you have. And that's why discovery is so important. It's, that nails it right on the head. We have to know what we've got if we're going to protect it. I've got a few questions here, so I want to stop and see if I can't, can't uh, answer these. Uh, Zed Key, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Are WAF and API gateways complementary or mutually exclusive? They are absolutely complementary. I think that there are some overlaps between the two, uh, but they are definitely complementary. And I'll also add that the way no name does API security. Both WAFs, API gateways, we recommend them all. Uh, you need to have those technologies. We think that they all play a, a valuable part in the protection. Uh, and we integrate with the vast majority of those to be able to see, to be able to see what's not going through an API gateway, you have to first know what is going through the API gateway. So if you integrate with the gateway in order to see what APIs it controls and what traffic it is, monitor, it, it is managing, then you subtract uh, those off of the total of all the APIs that you find in other network traffic and through running through other network devices. And you can say, hey, here's an API and I know it's not going through my Apogee or my MuleSoft or my Tyke or my, you know, whatever it is, whatever that API gateway is. Um, and then uh, Sedki also asked, what drives an individual to walk down white hatting versus black hatting? Uh, that's a <laughs> that's a pretty good question. I wish I knew. You know, there have been so many times as a pen tester that I could have been a gazillionaire and be sitting on a beach somewhere, sipping a, a drink with an umbrella on it today uh, and every day. Uh, that it makes me wonder why I didn't go into black hatting. But the truth is that there is a lot of information out there on, you know, how to be a white hat or how to be a black hat. Today, you can make money either way. If you want to sign up and be a bug bounty guy, uh, it doesn't take much. They'll vet you and make sure that you don't have a criminal record or anything like that. And then you can go into breaking into systems and documenting it, delivering that documentation to the company that you broke into or that you compromised, and they'll pay you for it. And that's a beautiful thing. Uh, now, I, I won't say that it's gigantic money or anything like that, because most of them uh, are not, unless you find the absolute best company to, to, to be their, uh, their white hat, their researcher, and then you get the most severe, find the most severe vulnerability in their environment, then you might get a big payout from them. But um, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, we could probably talk for hours on that, Sedki. I appreciate it. And then uh, uh, the next question is, what are the reactions of companies that you find gaps in the security for? Uh, you know, we typically work with the security team first. Uh, and their reaction is often 
very positive. They are wanting to know where those security gaps are because oftentimes it's the low hanging fruit that is most accessible to either white hat or black hat hackers, whether it's the bug bounty or the guy that's trying to break into uh, our environment. And so it's the low hanging fruit. It's the things that, the, the, the mistakes that were made, the accidents that happened that got left out there. I, I tell the story with CISOs all the time and they, they often confirm that this, this happens in their environment. I usually uh, couch it in the, I know this would never happen to you. And they say, yeah, it happened last week. Um, but you have an API, it's got a bug, there's an issue associated with it. The developer says, oh, we got to fix that right now. It's a, it's a P1, uh, priority one. We got to take care of this right now. So they go out to uh, fix that API. And the first thing they do is turn off the authentication because they can run a number of tests against that API uh, and, and more tests when there's no uh, authentication turned on much faster. They test it, they figure out what the problem is, they fix the problem, ah, we got that done, great, they push it to master and it's all done. Ah, but they forgot to turn the, 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 the authentication back on at the API gateway. And those are the kinds of things that leave you out there hanging and going, oh no. Now, maybe nobody notices and, and that, that doesn't end up in compromised records, but it doesn't take much for those kinds of things to end up in a, uh, in a big issue where somebody can grab a hold of a lot of records very, very quickly. Um, fortunately, because it's often difficult to find those API endpoints, it does take some time. But that's why we want to give that information to that customer so that they have a window of opportunity to fix that low hanging fruit, to fix those issues that they identify in the environment and to reduce that attack surface before the bad guy gets to it. So the reaction is typically very positive. Now, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of one that wasn't super positive at first, but, but turned very positive. And that is uh, we showed a customer an API that was directly exposed to the internet. It wasn't going through the API gateway or the web application firewall. And in fact, because of the direct route it had, there was no authentication on that API when you used that route to get to it. Well, it was you know, still COVID and a lot of people are working from home and his engineer was, was working from home and the, the CISO said, oh no, I know that API. It's got critical corporate data in it and there is no, no way no, nope, never going to happen that that API is exposed to the internet. And his engineer who was working from home grabbed the URI off of our, uh, off of our environment, off of our demo, and plugged it into his system that he was working from home with. And he connected straight in and was able to download corporate data to his home. And he said, time out, boss. That API is absolutely exposed to the internet. And you need to know that, you know, it, you know I just got a whole bunch of data. And the boss was like, Meeting's over, guys. We're done. And they left. And we were like, huh, what happened? We were having a really great meeting. Well, they came back about three or four days later and they said, because the engineer downloaded corporate data to his home through, over the internet, and because it was exposed without authentication, they had to declare an incident. They had to go through the entire audit process. They had to go through the entire uh, remediation process. They had to make sure and get legal involved and all that kind of stuff and declare an incident. And at the end of the day, it took them three or four days to get it all cleaned up. There had not been any other compromise of that data, but that exactly told them why it was so necessary that they have this security that is monitoring or shielding right because they already had all kinds of shift left processes in, in place. They had best practices for deploying these APIs. They had best practices for how their uh, API gateway was to be configured and the web application firewall. But because somebody missed a step or missed a hole or didn't just didn't realize that this API now was exposed to the internet through an unprotected route, they were completely exposed that way. And, and that made a big, big difference. So again, the great question, and it leads to exactly my point for this whole talk of why shift left isn't enough because they had a good shift left program. And this demonstrated that even with that shift left, we need to monitor, we need to shield, we need to protect right. We've got to look at both sides of the equation. So no, no, uh, again, no blame. In fact, in this particular case, I don't know, but it was very likely that the security team had an opportunity to, uh, to review the configuration of that application that 
of, of the application or the the environment that left that API exposed and they missed it. They didn't see it. It, it. it could have been right there in front of them and they didn't realize, oh, stink. There it is. There's that API over there on that EC2 instance. And now it can go a different route that we didn't expect or that we didn't plan on. They didn't ever see that. And so very likely that, that, was e that, the, that the challenge for that one was on the security team and not something that the development team necessarily would have been responsible for, for creating. So I like to tell, to look at uh, our platform as bridging the gap between the security team uh, and the development team. So again, thank you very much for that, uh, for that question, Sedki. Um, this, the second part of, of the uh, Dart API security strategy is to analyze. Uh, and I'm gonna have to go pretty quickly now because I love this though. I'd rather do questions than, than talk to slides. So if you have questions, please put them in here and I'll, uh, I'll get to them in the Q&A. Uh, tab on this thing. Um, analyze. Uh, the analysis of APIs is a lot more than just looking at the traffic. It's a lot more than just looking at the schema of the API. That's all great. And that all leads to better testing for sure. When you know what the schema is, when you know how it was developed, all those kinds of things can improve your testing. We'll talk about testing in a minute. Uh, but the analysis needs to be of the entire API estate. Going back to the example that I brought up with Sedkey just a minute ago, if you analyze the devices that route those APIs, if you analyze the EC2 instances or the virtual machines that host those APIs, if you look at all of that information and do a complete analysis and discover the vulnerabilities or the configuration errors in the way that those things are set up, you very quickly can learn that, hey, there's a, there's a lot of things that I can do to improve the security of these APIs without having to redo anything. And so again, takes away a lot of that uh, uh, low hanging fruit and gives you the opportunity to see all of the issues associated with them. Now, the next thing that an API security strategy should be looking to do is to remediate. And remediation is everything from creating a trouble ticket and having somebody respond to that trouble ticket and then monitoring and managing those tickets all the way through to being able to automate some of the issues that you find. Maybe somebody forgot to check the box inside of an API gateway that turns on the rate limiting, and that should be automatic. If they don't have rate limiting, let's at least put the minimum rate limiting on there uh, so that we don't have a problem with too many packets, you know, creating a denial of service attack on our environment. So those are kind of the minimal things that uh, that remediation should do. I look at remediation as three steps. One is manual. And as far as I'm concerned, sending a ticket to JIRA or to Slack or ServiceNow, that's a manual process. Somebody sees an issue, they click a button, it sends the JIRA ticket off to the developers who are responsible for it. If the, the second uh, phase is the semi-automated way to, uh, to remediate, and that is something that requires a human to push a button. And in that particular case, it identifies that, hey, there's a, a policy for, I'll go back to the policy example. There's a policy that is missing a component uh, on my Apogee gateway. And we've got a good, solid uh, policy API uh, integrated with our Apogee gateway. So all we have to do is push the button. And now that particular feature of that policy gets turned on inside that gateway because of the integration that we have set up with them. And then the third way to remediate is a fully automated way. And again, manual, semi-automated, and fully automated. And fully automated comes in those particular situations where you've done it enough times and you've seen it in a semi-automated format enough times that you say, you know what? This is never a false positive. There's no way it can automatically basically shoot myself in the foot or in the head for that matter and kill my application. But what I need to do is I need to be able to do this because it takes time of, away from my team. I need to fully automate this particular uh, issue and, and be done with it. And one example where I have seen this implemented is in brute force attacks uh, or in attempted broken object level authorization. In the brute force attacks, you typically see 100, 1,000, a whole bunch of failed attempts to log in. They're all coming from the same IP address. They all are um, 
they all look very similar in that they're using a dictionary or they're using uh, a, a counting system to just count through or iterate through the number of user IDs, whatever they're doing. Uh, it's very obvious of what's happening and that they're trying to brute force their way in. And each time they get a failed login attempt uh, through that, it's very simple to create a, uh, a remediation that would automatically detect that this is a brute force. It's happened 500 times now. Let's just block that IP for the next 30 minutes. Chances are we block it for 30 minutes. It's not going to it, they're going to uh, either lose interest uh, or 30 minutes from now, they'll start up again and we'll block them again. And as a result, you know, that's a reasonable uh, automation to take place uh, in that environment. So remediation, again, manual, semi-automated and fully automated. And then the third or the last part of the Dart API security strategy is the testing capability. And the testing capability, again, is it's it's far left. It's as left shift as you can get. We want and, and and expect that good API security capabilities will include security testing of the APIs, not just features, functionalities, and performance, but testing of the security of those APIs as well. And I, I heard a really great uh, uh, presentation earlier. Uh, I think it was yesterday. It was before one of my presentations. And I thought the presenter just nailed it in that, you know, it was clear that if you started testing, you've got to test some more. And you really need to understand broken object level authorization, and you really need to understand IDOR. And if you understand what those two vulnerabilities are, uh, then you will have a much, much more proficient uh, API security test capability, because that is so, so important. And uh, let me just stop and talk about broken object level authorization for just a minute. Broken object level authorization is you're authorized into the system, excuse me, you're authenticated into the system. I always say it backwards the first time. You're authenticated into the system, but you gain access to information that you are not authorized. So you're user A, and all you should be able to get access to is user A's information, but when you try and get user B, C, D, and E's information, it comes back to you. Happens all of the time. And again, that is the situation, and that is what happened with, uh, uh, with, with the vast majority of those uh, uh, organizations that were compromised or, or who's, who, who were found to be vulnerable that I showed in, this, in the screen before. So if you, if you don't know uh, about broken object level authorization, please, please, if you do one thing from, get one thing from this presentation, please go do some research on broken object level authorization and find out how you can protect against that kind of thing. Now, all the testing in the world, it's still going to happen. And that's again, why shift left isn't enough and why as security professionals, we need to be monitoring on the right so that we can see when somebody actually has authenticated within the system and then tries to get, gain access to other people's information. And, and when you can identify those kinds of things through behavior modeling, through machine learning, it's not gonna happen through a signature-based system. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of web application firewalls lie, is they're really signature-based uh, systems. They might have some behavior and anomaly detection in them, but it's typically at the application level. So they can watch the application and they can see what's happening there, but seeing what's happening down at the API level is much more specific and it'll oftentimes look normal uh, in the course of what the application does, but won't be because of what's happening at the API level. And so again, you know, that was one of my earlier presentations of why web application firewalls aren't enough uh, as, as, not, as our API gateways. We recommend them, think you should use them, but at the end of the day, uh, they're, they just don't uh, have enough capability to look deep into the payload of every single API and then analyze the behavior of that payload as it's being requested and responded to uh, during the course of the transactions that happen through the APIs. So again, I want to thank everybody for your time. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit short and I've got plenty of time for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I would ask you to please drop them into, um, into the uh, question and answer session. Uh, I know this is being recorded for some other folks, but uh, if, you, uh, if you have time, um, 
please uh, drop a question. I'll be happy to answer them. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I'll hang out here for a while just to see if there's any questions. And uh, I hope to have a, a great rest of your uh, API days and uh, hope to see you uh, sometime in the future. Take care.